Hello everyone, I'm Harvey Brownstone, and today our guest is a multi-talented performer, an Emmy Award-winning television documentary producer, a show business historian, radio host, and best-selling author. He's written three books about show business legends, Lucille Ball, Ethel Merman, and Ella Fitzgerald. He's the irrepressible and incomparable Jeffrey Mark. Jeffrey, welcome to our show, and thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate it. It's, it's lovely to be here with you. Jeffrey, you are widely considered to be a walking encyclopedia of show business history, especially television. How in the world did you acquire so much information about the people and the shows that we all grew up with? I was lucky to be a baby boomer in New York City, where I was born in the late 1950s and 1960s. I think culturally we were very, very lucky because besides having the three networks in those days, CBS, NBC, ABC. We also had three or four more local television stations and they had to fill time. And what they filmed time, fill time with was old Al Jolson movies, things with Fanny Bryce, things with Eddie Cantor, things with Ethel Norman, films from the 1940s, World War II films, old television shows, even older than we were. And this was on seven days a week from six o'clock in the morning till about four o'clock in the morning. That's how New York City programmed itself. Well, if you were a baby boomer who had no blood brothers or sisters who needed to be entertained, I was plopped in front of our black and white television set and I watched and I learned because there was something about those people in the box that said to me, these are your people. And I, I have one of those brains and I began to learn and uh, all these years later. And of course, I've had tremendous, tremendous, tremendous mentors along the way, wonderful people who saw that I had talent and helped me. So it was a combination of having the culture thrust at me by that box every day, an intense curiosity, God-given talent and lovely, wonderful people who helped and an incredibly encyclopedic memory. Yes, yes. I can't tell you what I had for dinner last night, but I can tell you what was on Channel 11 in New York in 1963 between 3 p.m. and 7 p.m. every day. That's just how my brain works. And I love it. And so do all the rest of your fans. Now, Jeffrey, I must tell you that I'm a huge Lucille Ball fan. And in fact, one of the first episodes of our show was an interview with Lee Tannen, who wrote a wonderful book about oh, yes. his friendship with Lucy. Yes, Lee and I are friends. So I want to start our discussion of your books with The Lucy Book, a complete guide to her five decades on television. This encyclopedic book is an absolute must for every Lucy fan because you sat down with most of the key people who got so many insights and details about all of the Lucy shows, not just I Love Lucy. No, I, the, the original book, I'm calling it the original book because the new Lucy book is coming out next fall. There were so many books being written about Miss Ball and Mr. Arnaz, about their love lives, about their marriage, wonderful drama about them. But it missed the point. We're talking about Lucille Ball because of those wonderful, wonderful shows. And there had not been a book written really exploring episode by episode everything she did on television. So the original Lucy book is from live television of the late 1940s until she died. And even after every single time Lucille Ball appeared on national television, what happened? How did it come about? Who was there? What's interesting? Oh, look, she changed her hair. Oh, look, there's a flub there. Oh, there's somebody there who became a big star many years later. And as you said, I interviewed everybody who was still alive. The new Lucy book coming out next year takes all of that. It adds in all of her radio appearances through the years, starting in the 1930s, all of her films starting in the 1930s. Again, interviews with the people who were there and then new interviews. The original book had a foreword by Steve Allen. We're adding in a foreword by Fran Drescher. We have new interviews with Carol Burnett and Anne Margaret and Rich Little. I'm thrilled to be working on it, and I hope you guys next year will love this one even more than the original. 
Oh, I don't think there's any doubt. Now, you got the chance to interview Lucy in 1984 when she was at the Museum of Broadcasting, now the Paley Center, giving a presentation, which I was lucky enough to see on video. Can you tell us about that conversation you had with Lucy? It was mystical, magical, a little odd. Bill Paley, who was the head of CBS, started what he called back then the Museum of Broadcasting. The very first big thing they did was they brought Lucille Ball in to do a symposium. She wasn't going to teach. She wasn't going to read from a speech. She was going to answer questions. And I was lucky enough to get tickets. Miss Ball mustered through some of the most insipid questions I have ever heard in my life. Who did you like best on I Love Lucy? Uh, Mrs. Trumbull or Little Ricky? Kind of questions. Yeah. And Miss Ball... It took it in good stride, but you could tell if you watched closely, she was not amused. Not at all. In fact, several times she started applying her makeup right in front of the crowd. But when you spoke to her, what did she have to say? First, I got her to laugh, which is the biggest thrill of my life. Gary Morton, her husband, was sitting on the edge of the stage. And she was like, uh, that young man, the young man with the red beard. And Gary said, There's nobody out there, Lucy, with the red beard. No, I see him, him with the red beard. And they handed me the microphone and I said, Lucy, not much left on top, but I do have a red beard. Ah, ha, ha, ha. I got her to laugh. That would have been enough right there. But just in case I had a question ready, I said, your good friend, Jack Benny, which got her attention. Oh, okay. My good friend, Jack Benny. Your good friend, Jack Benny, said the reason people tune into sitcoms is that there is shtick written into the scripts. Changes from week to week, but things people look for, like with the honeymooners, you know, bang, zoom, one of these days, Alice. I said, in your shows, there were two pieces of that kind of shtick that you stopped using. I said, one was the crying jag. You know, ah, Ricky. And the other one was the spider. Could you, tell me, could you tell me why you stopped using it? And she looked at me for a second. I thought maybe I'd insulted her. And she said, young man, that is the most intelligent question about my comedy anybody's ever asked me. And for the next 20 minutes, she let me ask her question after question after question. Happily, I was there with a buddy of mine who had been a secretary in the Navy. And he We had had papers with him and wrote down every word she said. And that was the germ, the beginning of the Lucy book. Uh, It was an honor for me to be there. Uh, I paid a lot of money to be there. I'm glad I did. The answers she gave me are in the book. Now, of all the stars you've ever met, was Lucille Ball your favorite? Was she my favorite in that of all the stars I've loved, I loved her the most? Well, you know, it's funny. You, you have those ladies behind you. And I've written more books than that. But those are the ones that were my big hits. Certainly meeting Ethel Norman was a tremendous thrill. Uh, and I got to meet her several times. Uh, meeting Ella was like, wow, I can't believe I'm in the same room with her. And there's one more person. I guess I'll put them all on the same platform. One more that uh, I don't tell this story very often, but it's very true. In 1978, Eight. Mary Martin came to Broadway in a straight play called Do You Turn Somersaults with Anthony Quayle. And I got tickets for the closing night. And I'll tell you, it was a good play. Mary was brilliant. You understood why she was such a huge, huge star. And I had recently auditioned in that theater and I knew how to get back to the dressing rooms. I said, again, with a friend of mine, let's go backstage and see her. We go backstage and Mary's like looking at us like, okay, you must be somebody because you're here. They let you in, but like, who are you? And we turned to her and said, Miss Martin, you don't know who we are, but we're two of Peter's lost boys. And she went, (gasps) she said, my darlings, don't stand right there. Don't leave. And she closed the door in our face. And about 20 minutes went by and I thought, you know, there must be a back exit to her dressing room and we're just standing here for no reason. No, the door opened. Mary Martin had changed out of her stage makeup into street makeup. She was wearing a hostess gown. 
She had brewed tea. She had cookies out on a silver tray with doilies, brought us into her dressing room, let me sit at her feet, and for two hours, let me ask her questions about my career, about show business, about her career, about Ethel Merman. To be allowed that kind of access, I mean, she just done a play for two and a half hours. She had every reason to say, kids, I'm tired, go away. No, and there was nobody else there, by the way. She brewed the tea. She put out the coffee. She put out the cookies. All her, there's no assistant helping her. That kind of generosity floored me. And I've been lucky to say, amongst the biggest stars, I have enjoyed that kind of generosity. Again, I don't know if it's my personality or my encyclopedic knowledge where we engage and they go, wow, you really know what you're talking about. See, because I don't ask insipid questions. I ask good stuff. So that, that, that celebrity meeting, and then Mary and I became acquaintances after that. Same thing with Carol Channing. We became friends. And Carrie, Milton Burl and Kay Ballard and all the people who have helped me through the years. But yes, if I have to pick one, the one is Lucille Ball. I'm just sitting here in awe because I, I only wish I could have been with you at all of those encounters you've had with all of these stars. I just, I'm going to ask you later about whether you're going to write a memoir, but boy, oh boy, I will be first in line to buy it when you do. It's already written. Lucille Ball and Lucy Arnaz often said that Desi Arnaz didn't get enough credit for his contribution to the creation of the TV sitcom. Do you agree with that, Jeffrey? I think poor Desi has gotten such a short shrift in the media. Either people say that he created I Love Lucy or he created single-handedly the three camera system upon which I Love Lucy was based or they don't mention him at all. And I think the truth is a little more complicated. Desi Arnaz, who I never got to meet. So this is research talking here. Yes, he was gorgeous. Yes, he was talented, very talented. He was also brilliant, a brilliant mind that was well-educated. Desi's people in Cuba were very wealthy, very political. His father was mayor of the town and then governor of the area. His uncle was the chief of police. One of his grandfathers was the co-founder of the Bacardi rum business. So he came from good stock. And he lived through a coup in his island where he had to escape and came to this country with his father with nothing. And from nothing, he made himself into a star. And from making himself into a star, he met Miss Ball. And that led to Lucille Ball saying to CBS, who asked her, would you please come to television? She had a radio series called My Favorite Husband. Bring it to TV. And she said, no. Not unless you let Desi be my husband. And they said, we can't have that. That is a mixed racial marriage. We can't put that on the air. And she said, why not? He is my husband. The story of how that came about is a long one. I don't want to bore the wonderful people who are watching us. But they came up with the idea. Jess Oppenheimer, a name that's not said often enough, was the creator of I Love Lucy, meaning he created the concept of the show who these characters are and what they do. He had two brilliant writers, Madeline Pugh, Martin Davis, Bob Carroll Jr. to do the heavy lifting for the scripts. And they did a pilot and it sold. Well, Desi gets a call because the show was going to go on for Philip Morris cigarettes. Hey, when are you guys coming back East to do the show? He said, what do you mean coming back East? In those days, believe it or not, most of television was live on the east coast they would film off of a television monitor of a show and it would be shipped all over the country those films were called kinescopes well philip morris didn't want a kinescope on the east coast of a live show the arnezes did on the west coast they wanted them back east where most of the cigarette purchases were because most of television was east of the mississippi river there weren't a lot of television stations yet in 1951 and Desi said, no, the reason we took this show was so we could live in our house and putter around in our ranch and be together. 
Well, they said, you know, we need Lucille Ball that way. He said, well, what if we film it? They said, we can't. We need Lucille Ball live in front of an audience. That's what makes her tick. We saw her do it on radio. She came alive. We want that. So it was Desi who said, well, what if we film the show in front of an audience? And they said, oh, if you can do that, fine. And he committed to it without ever knowing how to do it. One person could not have made all of that happen. Jess Oppenheimer and Desi hired 100 of the greatest talents in show business to direct cinematography, Carl Freund, to do everything differently than it had ever been done before. The idea to do it was Desi's. Jess was the producer and they hired the right people in the right places at the right time. But the germ of the idea was indeed Desi's. So he has to get enormous credit for it. Desi, with those hundred people, really started Desi Lu Studios. It was Desi who grew it. Jess was the producer of I Love Lucy. He wasn't the producer of Desi Lu. Desi Arnaz was the producer of Desi Lu. And it was Desi's genius. And maybe coming from the kind of family he did and having a military background in his family, he was able to run things very precisely. And eventually he found out that RKO Studios was being sold. He bought it. And he and Lucille Ball owned the biggest movie studio in the world. That's what Desi Arnaz did. And he happened to be a wonderful musical comedy actor. And it turns out he was remarkably funny. I can't imagine any other actor playing Ricky on I Love Lucy and making it believable the way he did. So in Mr. Arnaz, you had a genius producer, a genius showman, and a marvelous, marvelous actor. Luck, luck, luck. Okay, Jeffrey, let's move on to your book entitled Ethel Merman, The Biggest Star on Broadway. This is an in-depth and sometimes shocking account of her life and career. We all knew her as the charismatic star with the huge voice, but Jeffrey, I had no idea there was so much drama and tragedy in her personal life. Yeah, that's the most controversial book I ever wrote. Uh, it's controversial because I chose not to quote anybody else. I wrote all of it as if I'm telling you a long, long story about a wonderful person. So that was controversial, the style. And the other controversial thing is I went into depth about her dramas, about the sadness in her personal life. And I'm the only person who has ever written about her marriage to Ernest Borgnine, what it was really like, what really happened, and why technically they were married for 28 days, but in reality, 48 hours. Well, in her book, she has a blank page where she describes her marriage to Ernest Borgna. I couldn't believe it. It was brilliant writing. Chapter 37, my marriage to Ernest Borgna. And you turn the page, chapter 38. <laughs> That's right. But she had an illicit affair with a famous married man. She had four disastrous marriages, the loss of loved ones due to drug overdose and murder. I mean, I, I just... Anybody who thinks they know Ethel Merman doesn't, unless they've read your book. Well, th I thank you for that. You know, people's personal lives, I get the most I get asked about are the personal lives of Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz, and I refuse to discuss them. With Ella, the same thing. You had no idea of a tragedy that would lie behind all the fame. But what I say about the Arnaz is, I think is true for most everybody. And when people press the point, when I, when I appear in person and do shows and they want to ask questions, this is the answer I give. Why do you need to know this? All right, so here's, here's the answer to your question. Go anywhere, wherever you're living, and folks, all of you who are watching right now, anywhere in your neighborhoods, knock on a door, quickly administer truth serum and sit down with the person and ask them about their personal lives. And you're going to get the same stories except the names won't be famous. We all have tragedy in our personal lives, all of us. 
we all have things we hide from the public, we hide from our friends, we hide from our family, whether it's you've been molested or you have a drug problem or your heart was broken or you got robbed or you got mugged or you got raped. There's drama. Life brings drama. That's, that's a part of life that's unfortunate. Life is tough for everybody. There's nobody out there who just skates through life golden. No matter what you may think of people's lives or be jealous of them, the truth is everybody's got it hard. But I think the difference is that when you see someone with a public profile like Ethel Merman, who was so upbeat, she brought so much joy to so many people, and she did it on the stage where she had to do it every night, eight times a week. Absolutely. And behind the scenes, there was all of this unhappiness. It's different. It's different because the average Joe down the street isn't living a life in front of a whole world. They're living a life in front of a small community. Ethel used to say that being at a Broadway show was like being a nun, taking the veil. Your entire aura, <laughs> all of your energy has to be on that show. To do that eight times a week, you have no other life. You can't go shopping. You can't be frivolous. You really can't go out and get drunk because you got to get up the next day and sing for two and a half hours and you better be damn good at it because you're the star of the show. That's why perhaps celebrity drama is so much more interesting to us because how do they do that? How do they make us laugh and make us cry and sing to us and make, you know, and they go home and they have all these problems. And the same is true for everybody, including me. I have been doing this now for 47 years. Won an Emmy, I've been Grammy nominated. I have been on the stage in New York. I have toured the country. I've toured the world. I've been singing for a long time for my supper. I have a new album coming out next year. Jeffrey Mark sings the Ella Fitzgerald songbook. But if you looked at my personal life, I've, I've, I've had my lumps. I've had my tragedies and my dramas. There. In 2016, you released the Family Affair Cookbook, which you co-authored with Kathy Garver, who played Sissy on Family yes. Affair. It's a real piece of 60s nostalgia, and it made me remember how much I loved that show, especially the wonderful Sebastian Cabot, who played Mr. French. He was really the anchor of the show because Brian Keith, who was the titular star, had the same deal that Fred McMurray had on My Three Sons. Both shows were produced by the same people. In that, these men came in for about eight weeks and all of their scenes and all of the episodes were filmed at once. So the whole show, the entire season's shows had to be written in advance. They couldn't go week to week. These men came in, all of their close-ups, all of their scenes with everybody else. Then they went back to, to episode number one of that season and went through the season with everybody else without him there. So these men made fortunes doing as little work as possible. It was a very difficult way to shoot a series, but it was very, very popular. But I, I love the book. Uh, it's, it's not my best work, but Kathy came to me and asked me to please do it with her. And uh, it was a joy. I loved it. Thank but you. your latest book is about the first lady of song, the absolute heart and soul of music, in my opinion. It's entitled Ella, a biography of the legendary Ella Fitzgerald. Now there was a musical talent that was absolutely spectacular. And yet, Jeffrey, until your book came out, very little was known about her personal life. It's well known that Ella didn't like talking about her past. How did you learn so much about her personal life? A good journalist, first of all, does just tons and tons and tons of research. So you know, I had every major entertainment library in the country. I, I had to listen to every song she ever recorded, which meant I had to go to the record labels and let them allow me to walk through their vaults and listen to things that were never released. I had to see every television show she ever did. Luckily, I was able to get European television specials she did and concerts. 
that were filmed or videotaped that were never released and watch those. And the same process, interview everybody who was still alive. Happily, I got the ear of a man named Val Valentin. Val Valentin was the man who was the uh, recording engineer for most of her work from about 1956 till she died. And uh, we became friends. And the idea for the book was his. Young man, you better start writing a book about us before we all die, and then you'll have no answers. So I've actually written two books about Ella Fitzgerald. The first one came out in the 90s, and I wanted to revisit it because I had made a promise to Ella that I would not write the real truth of, of some of her tragedies. She found it embarrassing. She had spent her entire life covering up these stories. After she passed away, I felt my promise to her didn't need to be any longer. So I wrote another book doing more research and telling the truth. And uh, it's been enormously well received. In fact, her foundation, the Ella Fitzgerald Foundation uses my book as their Bible. It sits on everybody's desk. When they have to know something, they look through my book and they find out the answers. And, and is it true that the book took 30 years to write? Yeah. Wow. I love the story of how Marilyn Monroe helped Ella Fitzgerald's career and taught her to be more demanding and to insist on being treated like a star. Can you tell our viewers about that, Jeffrey? Sure. It's probably the most asked question about the latest book was, was their, their friendship. There is something about Ella's singing voice that seemed to speak to the very sensitive stars of the 1950s. Marilyn Monroe, Montgomery Clift, Marlon Brando, those kinds of people. When they would get uptight, when they would feel deeply the pressures of their careers, would put on Ella to sort of mellow themselves out. So they were all enormous fans of hers. And if they got a chance to meet her, even better. She was performing everywhere in those days. Ella was performing probably out of a 52-week year, 40 weeks out of the year, she was not home singing someplace in the world. So it was easy to go see her perform. Marilyn was one of those people. And Ella twice really got help by her. Once was in Denver. Uh, Ella was opening up at a nightclub. Marilyn was shooting some scenes in Colorado for a film and went to see her. Well, a great publicity time, a, a great photo opportunity, as publicists like to say. And they did all the pictures of the two of them together. And then Ella was going to be escorted to the back entrance of the nightclub because the club did not let black people in the front door. And Marilyn hooked her arm in Ella's and said, now Marilyn, that breathy thing was for films. Marilyn knew how to talk. And she said loudly, Marilyn Monroe and Ella Fitzgerald do not enter this nightclub unless Marilyn Monroe and Ella Fitzgerald enter through the front door. Well, she was Marilyn Monroe. What were they going to do? Ella went in the front door. Never again did Ella go through a back door into anywhere. Marilyn kicked that door open for her. Ella wanted to play the Macombo. They couldn't book her. They wouldn't book a black woman. Black and woman. Marilyn went to the owners and said, I'm about to make you wealthy. You book Ella Fitzgerald for 10 days. I will be here every night with a party of 10. Every night, a different group of people, but they will be the biggest stars in films and recordings and television. If you book Ella, they booked Ella. The place was sold out every night and Ella never again had trouble getting booked anywhere. Marilyn was not a pushover. Marilyn demanded the best lighting, the best hairstyle, the best makeup, the best costuming. And she felt that Ella didn't demand enough for herself. And that's when you begin to see Ella wearing really glamorous costumes. 
that's when Ella began wearing wigs to look more glamorous, wearing jewelry to look glamorous. She never did learn how to put on makeup properly. Marilyn tried, but Ella just couldn't do it. But to the, to the, to the most that, that Marilyn could help Ella get glamour into her stage persona, Marilyn helped her. And I love her for it. Me too. Now, Jeffrey, you produced some amazing documentaries about I Love Lucy, Cheers, Mary Tyler Moore, Bob Newhart, The Addams Family, and The Munsters. How did you select the shows that you wanted to profile? I wish I could tell you that I did that. It was the production company. The production company makes a deal with one of the cable stations. In this case, it was TLC to do stuff. And they needed someone like me to do it. It started because of the Lucy Ball connection, because of the Lucy book. Inside television's greatest, I Love Lucy, uh, most of the people associated with the show feel it was the best documentary ever made. In fact, the next day, Barbara Streisand called the company asking for a copy of the show. It's like, oh, we did good. And that led to all the other shows. I love doing them. When you were doing all of those shows, you got to interview most of the key people involved in those shows. Did any of the stars surprise you in terms of how they behaved or what they had to say? I don't think the stars of those shows surprised me. A couple of people through the years have surprised me. One was Robert Stack. Robert Stack was the star of the Untouchables television series, and I was interviewing him. How I came to interview him was kind of quirky because we were both going to be on a flight from Los Angeles to New York. And in the first class lounge, I asked him, hey, when we get to New York and you settle in, would it be okay if I interview you about working on the Lucy show? He said, well, we've got five and a half hours to kill in the air. Why don't we do it on the airplane? And he arranged for coffee to be served and, and I don't know, sweets or cake or something. And for the two of us to talk privately. And I, I don't know, 10 minutes went by and he interrupts a question. What is it with you men? And I think he meant gay men. What is it with you men that you can't let these women die? You can't let these women, why do you pester about these dead women's lives? And I, I said to him, excuse me, I agreed to be interviewed on this airplane. I'm the one who arranged where we're sitting. I brought in coffee. You did that. Since you're so unhappy, Mr. Stack, let's end this right now. Happy flight. And I got up and he said, oh, no, no, sit down, sit down. You're here already. We, we might as well finish this. And I was kind of angry, quite frankly. And I, I finished it about 15 minutes later and I'm sitting on the aisle. I see coming towards me every flight attendant on the airplane. And I thought, oh my goodness, he's found a way to have me thrown overboard with a parachute. I'm, you know, I'm about to be put out the airplane. No, the, the head flight attendant from behind her back pulls out a magnum of champagne. Mr. Mark, on behalf of American Airlines and Mr. Stack, we want to apologize for how you were treated. He feels very badly. I was very appreciative that he realized what a jerk he had been and that perhaps he had been a little homophobic. And I'm glad he was sorry for that because he was being a jerk. Well, I am too. And I think maybe you educated him. I do that a lot. Now you're known to be the expert on the golden age of television. Many people are saying that we are now in a new golden age of television because of all the channels and streaming platforms out there. Are there any current or recent shows that you really like? I don't think I would surprise you. I enjoyed The Crown a lot. Uh, the Amazing Mrs. Maisel, I enjoyed that show a lot. But there aren't a lot of them. Talent gets diluted after a while. There are so many platforms and so many cable stations and so many ways for entertainment to be out there. I think we had better quality when there were just three broadcast networks and maybe PBS because the money and the talent were being focused to just this much. Now, I'm not saying there weren't terrible TV shows. There have always been terrible ones, but there was wonderful stuff 
every week, even now, and I lived through this, and I look back 1960s, and any week in the 1960s, you could see Lucille Ball, Dick Van Dyke, Ethel Merman, Ella Fitzgerald, Carol Channing, Flip Wilson, Carol Burnett, uh, Glenn Campbell, Frank Sinatra, Andy Griffith, Dean Martin, Red B. Skelton, B. Benaderet, these marvelous, marvelous talents, and they were on every week. And if they didn't have their own show, they were guesting every week on something. I don't think we have that anymore. I think we have shows that are aimed at a very specific population. They're not meant to be big hits. The show we talked about, Inside Television's Greatest, I Love Lucy, got about 1.6 million people watching it the first time it aired. And of course, they aired it over and over again. And it was considered to be okay. It was the biggest audience TLC had had at that time. Today, CBS, NBC, ABC, Fox, if you got 1.6 million people watching, oh, that's a big deal. When Lucy was on, 40 million people were watching. Big difference. When you diminish the audience, I think you diminish the quality. There are only so many really talented writers, directors, actors, cinematographers out there. So you're getting a lot of mediocre stuff. So there's 9 million ways to watch things. And I still drift back to classic stuff. I try to watch new things. I try to look for, there, there have been made in the last five or 10 years, for instance, documentaries about World War II to the point where they're almost romancing Adolf Hitler. Inside Adolf's last minutes, inside Adolf's secretary, inside Adolf's shoes. And people are watching this crap. So it was probably always true in show business. One needs to be a discriminating audience and go, all right, I'm going to find the best of the best and kind of ignore the rest. So, so that's what I do now. I try to sample new things and there are wonderful new things out there, but I'll, I will put the 1960s or 50s television against that any day. Jeffrey, I want to ask you a bit about your own life now. You Please. had a very unique relationship with your partner, Joel, who was your soulmate and love of your life for 47 years. But no one knew you were a couple. He passed away a few years ago, and then you came out publicly. I think it's really important for the younger generation of LGBTQ people to understand what our generation of gay people went through. Do you agree? I agree. Well, how are you doing now, Jeffrey? Still hurting. Uh, I, I appreciate your asking the question. Here's the story. I found myself in September of 1972 in a suburb of Baltimore, Maryland called Randallstown. Randallstown had just built its own high school. Lucky for me, they built it with an actual theater attached to it. And I found myself at 13, two weeks shy of being 14, my first day in high school in a musical comedy class. There were about 20 of us in the class. It was a special class. And he paired us up in twos and twos to work on a musical comedy song together. And he paired me up with this guy, Joel Kavik. Now, I was the youngest kid. He was the oldest kid. I had been skipped two grades in school. He had been left behind in one. So we were, although we were four years apart in age, we were one grade apart in school. And I walked over to him and he saw me coming and I, I saw this look on his face. And there were risers right behind him. And he took a back step and went up one to be taller than I, because Joel was shorter than I, just so he could look down at me. <sighs> Folks, if you're watching this, the next little bit, you're just going to have to take my word that this actually happened. We started to talk. And my soul left my body and his soul left his body. And our souls met between us, embraced, and exchanged DNA. And my soul came back into my body with some of his DNA, and his soul went back into his body with some of my DNA. I fell in love with him. It took about a minute. I'm 13. I've never had a date. I've never had a kiss. I've never had anything. 
we became a couple. Our fathers were drunken, homophobic child molesters. Our mothers were codependent narcissists. We spoke the same language. He was terrified that anyone would think he was gay or bisexual, but he loved me. And uh, for 47 years, we were together. We often talked about living together. More he than I. Jeff, we need to be in the same bed every night. We need to grow old together. I said, well, uh, the first 20 years, it was the homophobic thing. His internalized homophobia. The last 25 years was that although I got clean and sober 32 years ago, he did too, but he couldn't stay clean and sober. And as much, uh, it's, it's hyperbole to say that I love Joel Kabik more than anybody has ever loved anybody in history. No, not more, but nobody loved another person more than I did. And he felt the same way. But, 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 but. I could not allow him to live under my roof and be drunk and stoned. As much as I adored that man, the thrill of just holding his hand, I couldn't give up my sobriety and my recovery for him, not even for him. I get it. All I can tell you is I've known true love. I've known it since I was 13. My heart was owned by him. His art was owned by me. We had a very unconventional relationship. It had to be open because we weren't together a lot because we were living in different states. But I loved him more and more each day. And I still love him more and more each day. He is the love of my life. And uh, he had a heart attack, survived it. But in the testing they did afterwards, found the tumor that eventually killed him. And uh, it's a new life being a widower. It's a new life living without him. I have a daughter with two beautiful grandchildren. I mean, the DNA, they're his, but they're ours. And uh, after he died, she moved here to be near me. So I, I get to see them. In fact, I'll be seeing them later this afternoon. I consider myself to be the luckiest son of a gun on the planet. I met the love of my life at 13. At 15, my career started. Who could ask for anything more? I listened to one of your recent interviews where you said that nothing in life is free and that even if you're talented, you have to pay a price for even that. What did you mean when you said that? There is a thing about life from how I see it. If one is extraordinarily talented, extraordinarily good looking, extraordinarily well endowed, extraordinarily wealthy, extraordinarily famous. The price you pay for that to begin with is that it makes you different from other people. You have very few peers, very few people who will understand what your life is about. That makes you different. That's a price to pay. It makes people jealous of you, resentful of you, uh, a price to pay. Love is not free. Real deep love is hard work. It is falling in love with somebody over and over and over again. It is trying to understand another person. Now I'm going to switch gears a little bit here. I read that you witnessed John Lennon's murder. That must yes. have been unspeakably horrific. I feel badly about it because... I might have been able to help. Uh, my sister from another mister, Phyllis Viana. Phyllis lived on the same street as John and Yoko, but across the street and a few doors down. And there was a wonderful restaurant in her building called Noodles. And in those days in New York, it was not unusual for people to go to dinner at midnight or one o'clock in the morning. And we decided to have a late supper together. And I'd gotten off the subway right at Central Park West and 72nd Street where the Dakota was, that's the building in which they lived. And I was walking down the street. And in those days, the Dakota, there was this great big arch that was a driveway that led you into a courtyard. 
And inside the courtyard is where the actual front door to the Dakota is. These days, there's a great big metal gate. You can't get anywhere near it because of this. I just, like my foot is hitting the arch and bang, bang, bang. So I look in the arch and I see John lying on the floor and I see whatever his name was over him. But I didn't know who it was. It was too dark out to see. I didn't know, oh, that's John Lennon. But I did see that somebody got murdered. I could have called the police. I could have run for a cop. I could have, I ran. I ran to Phyllis's building and locked myself in her apartment and caught my breath. She was in the bathtub and I turned my television set on. And that's when I learned that what I had just seen was John Lennon. I've always felt guilty if I had done something, if I had called the cops, if I had, would he have lived? Would it have been a difference? I'll never know. But I always felt that that may be the most cowardly thing I've ever done. But that's the story. Well, when there's a shooter out there and you don't really know what's going on or who's going to be next, I think it's very understandable that you just needed to get out of there. And I personally don't see how you could have changed anything. But it's a terribly it's traumatic thing, terribly traumatic. And you've really lived a very eventful life. I mean, by that, I don't mean that everything was by any means easy or happy. You've experienced parental rejection, bigotry by the KKK, great highs and challenges in show business, and of course, love and loss. You did write a memoir, right? Yes, I've written a book. It'll be published. The, the new Lucy book is coming out the summer of 2022 and my book is called the devil was born in brooklyn will be coming out about six months after that while i'm making a date with you to come back on our show because that memoir is going to be one of those books you can't put down i think my memoir from a writing standpoint is probably the best thing i've ever written i never let anybody read things i've written ahead of time, except of course the publishers. But because this was so personal, there was an enormously iconic, famous writing team, Austin and Irma Kalish, who wrote Family Affair and F Troop and Good Times and, and Maud and all in the family. And they're very, very close friends of mine. Nobody called him Austin. Everybody who loved him and knew him called him Rocky. And when I had about, oh, 150 pages of my memoir, done. I asked them, not is this a good story, but is this a good book? Is it compelling writing? And I, I let them read it. And they invited me over to their home. And they said, so this is a novel and you're using yourself as the main character. So what, 20% of this actually happened and the rest of it you made up. So what's the percentages here? And I said, folks, it's not a novel. Everything in there happened. In fact, there are some things in my life I haven't put in there because I didn't tell about the romantic story arc of Joel and me uh, because I promised him I would never tell anybody. And they said, Jeffrey, as famous as you are, and the Merman book had not yet come out and the second L book had not come out. In fact, Family Affair hadn't come out yet. They said, as famous as you are, this is the book people are going to remember you for. They said, it's brilliant. So I, I, I have good hopes for it. We'll see what happens. I think it's probably going to end up being made into a movie. And who could they possibly get to play me? I don't know. There's nobody out there like me. I don't know who they could get. And for Joel, good heavens, some incredibly good looking, incredibly talented man would have to play Joel. But uh, first, let's get the book out there. Then we'll worry about the movie. Well, I got to say, Jeffrey, I don't think one visit to our show is going to be enough. There's so much about show business history that I'd love to ask you. So many stars I want to know about. Promise me you'll come back soon so we can continue this conversation. Thank you so much, Jeffrey, for taking the time to come on our show. I've enjoyed our conversation immensely. I have too. I have too. It's a good thing you don't live near me. I'd probably ask you out to dinner. <laughs> and I'd say yes. And I'd bring my partner. Our guest has been the multi-talented performer, producer, author, historian, and media personality, Jeffrey Mark. 
My name is Harvey Brownstone. Thank you to our producer, Steve Silver. Thank you all for joining us. See you next time. Remember to subscribe to the Harvey Brownstone Interviews YouTube channel. And be sure to check out more great interviews with Harvey Brownstone on HarveyBrownstoneInterviews.com.